My name is Gemma and I have two daughters and my younger daughter, who is three and a half, has a life-limiting condition. She was born with this condition and um, at birth we were told, well at birth we weren't told very much at all. It was a very rare condition and nobody really uh, spoke to us about what that meant. Um, but if what it meant was that most of the children with this condition didn't survive beyond two years of age. Now, Kira is now three and a half, so she has defied that. Um, but uh, that, that's that's kind of why I'm why I'm here to talk about end of life plans and uh, my kind of thoughts about it. My opinion of my day to day is it's a very normal day to day. Um, Kira has lots of medical issues. Um, she uses a wheelchair. She's on twenty four hour oxygen. She has a range of medications. Having said all of those things, she is also a very active, able, lively three and a half year old who has a six year old sister. Thought about how we how we wanted to deal with it. Did we want Kira at home with us? Did we want to be in the hospice? Um, did we want Kathleen, our older daughter, to be with us through that process? My six year old was three and a half um, when Kira got very seriously ill, and she asked us the question: Is Kira going to die? which I dealt with straightforward and said and explained that yes, we'd been told by the doctors that this would happen, that she wouldn't grow up to be a, a big girl like her um, and have always spoken to Kathleen very openly about this um, and have spent time encouraging her to ask us questions, have reassured her that I'll always be honest and, and tell her the truth um, and let her know what's happening. And we've done that throughout. And I think from, from her point of view, she talks about it. She talks about it. She talks about it quite matter-of-factly. And then other times she gets very, very upset about it. Um, so for us, talking about death, it's, it's not a day-to-day -day occurrence by any stretch of the imagination, but it's regular and it will come up in discussion, um, obviously come up in discussion for ourselves as, as, as Kira's mum and dad, but as well with Kathleen. Other people's response to us has varied very, very much. Um, very difficult for family members, um, siblings for both myself and, and my husband um, and um, grandparents, Kira's grandparents. Very difficult and I think for some of them they have just not been able to, not been able to take it on board and have limited, limited their contact with them because sometimes they don't know what to say, they don't know how to say what they want to say. Um, they don't say anything because they're scared in case they upset you. All of those things are there. And um, it's been an interesting process for us in that sense because what we've had to do is, is kind of guide them through it as well. Um, and when we've talked about plans, end of life plans, and other family members have found that difficult, we've, we've had to just kind of keep going and say, look, you need to know that this is how we're going to do it and why we want to do it this way. With regards to friends, it's been quite... It's shown quite a dividing line for us. It's been quite black and white. Some friends have been able to take it on board, have taken time to get to know Kira, have, have put lots of time and energy into that, and have taken the time to understand what we want to happen and how we want it to be, and how we talk to Kathleen about it as well. And other friends have just not been able to handle that at all, and have really just pulled away and even meeting new people for the first time, very quickly get a gauge as to whether I will tell them our story or not. Some people you know immediately that they will, they will they'll handle it and they'll be able to understand what's happening and be supportive. And other people you know very, very quickly whether they would just not be able to take that information and they, they wouldn't be supportive. And you see times that I've told family, friends, other, other people you kind of meet along the way, um, you sometimes see a physical response from people. People physically pull back from you. They might have the initial hug and kind of say, oh, I'm so sorry, and then you see them kind of withdraw from you. So there's, there's been that reaction as well, and I think what it has done for us is very clearly define who we need around us and who we don't. And it's been selfish decisions we've made for our family with regards to what's good for our family. Um, who's going to be supportive to us, who's going to help us through this and who's also going to be right for Kathleen and Kira and, and give them the right responses just now. So, School and nursery. Kathleen is in primary two and Kira has just started mainstream nursery. 
Prior to Kathleen starting primary school, I went to the school to explain from Kathleen's point of view, the circumstances around Kira, And I wanted to be very clear with the school as to how we manage that, how we talk about it, and also be very clear with the school how I wanted them to manage that with Kathleen. My concern, when Kathleen kind of entered the wider social world, kind of primary school, it's very difficult because you know she is going to meet a lot of children, yes, but my concern was adults an adult's response to a child talking about death. Kathleen's very open about it and will tell people, my little sister's going to die. Um, which obviously some people have a, a response to that and think, oh, what I've found is with the school, they've been great. They have supported us in how we wanted to support Kathleen. Um, some members of the staff have been up to the hospice. So they spent time there to get a sense of, of what the hospice is about. They've looked at if the staff needed support as to how to introduce the issues to other children. Um, and also because we're not following a religious kind of, we're not going a religious route with regards to Kira and, and Kira's passing, was very keen that the school were aware of that for Kathleen so that she wasn't getting confusing messages um, and that she was able to kind of make, make up her own sense of what was happening with guidance from ourselves. I would say as hard as it is and as difficult as it is to face the reality of what's ahead our take on it has been if you know Kira has Kira will have a short life we know that she's she's survived longer than we thought she was going to um, but the most important thing for us has been to to face that reality to acknowledge that that is going to happen it's going to happen sooner than anybody wants it to but you you live life to the full you give her a full and happy short life and that with regards to end of life not shying away from it speaking to people about it um, not taking on other people's difficulties and issues around it but allowing yourselves to talk about it and talk honestly about how you feel and that brings a whole range of emotions but if I kind of feel that you plan for everything else that you do in life you need to plan for this as well and with regards to the end of life plan, having that done, having that written, it's a way in a, in a filing cabinet somewhere. I know it's there and I know when the time comes, I can spend my time with Kira and not be concerned about anything else. I'm Jennifer Payton and I work as a family social worker at Robin House Children's Hospice, um, part of CHAS. A lot of the time we can learn from the children or young people themselves or their siblings. Um, the children actually have a fantastic way of kind of taking in what's going on around about them, um, being open and honest and they can be really robust and understanding the situation more than adults can be. To begin with, the first kind of key point is, you know, it's open communication, it's creating the opportunities for families to talk about what is going on for them. Um, we can guarantee that every family is thinking about it when their child is referred. Um, from the point of diagnosis, you know, from the first time they come through the hospice doors. So we need to be seen to be comfortable talking about it and we are, you know, the perfect environment to do that because that's why we exist. Um, so we have to be seen to be comfortable, create these opportunities and, you know, keep up the communication at all times throughout the team. Um, the second point would be early communication. It's, you know, for us it's really important to get in there from the get-go. We don't want to be kind of months, years down the line and for families not to be aware of, you know, what we actually exist for, you know, the kind of areas of the house that we have where the child can go um, after they have died and the family can spend time with them, you know, we have the Rainbow Room Suite for that purpose, so, you know, it is our job to be providing this information early on and the third point is that we have to sometimes be quite creative with, you know, how we can communicate. Um, we talk a lot about families because there are a lot of our children who maybe aren't able to articulate their wishes or their needs or wants and we are working with the families but there are some of our children and young people who you know have different ways of communicating and we need to be able to establish clear lines of communication with them to to understand what their wishes and needs are um, as well as still managing to meet the needs of the wider family and again getting them talking so we can be quite creative, we can use you know, artistic mediums, we can use 
I mean, car journeys are a huge thing. You can get a lot of information from parents, you know, if you're not sitting down and I want no one talking to them, they can be more relaxed. Um, we use books, you know, we use lots of different methods to, you know, communicate with our families and refer children and young people and siblings. Um, the fourth point would be to keep the communication lines open. Um, Again, back to the open communication thing right at the start, you know, if we are comfortable with it, we keep the communication lines open. Families are going to approach us, they're going to approach other members of staff, they're going to be happy to talk about what's actually going on with their child and we can share that journey with them. We've got to make it clear to them that we're there from the beginning right through to the end and for the aftercare with the bereavement support and the more information they've got at the beginning to start with, the easier their journey can be if they know that they're not going it alone. And the last point would be about the kind of the practical side of um, recording wishes, recording needs, wants, um, worries, fears. It's trying to it's, it's trying to kind of support them to get down what they they're thinking about day in day out. I mean. We know that families, you know, like I've said, that come in over the hospice door and they do think about what's going on. If there's another bereavement in house, it triggers a lot of emotions for them. So it's about us trying to support them to record their thoughts and their wishes. And it's almost kind of trying to kind of put it somewhere so that they don't have to be worrying about it day in, day out. And they know that they've shared it with us. And that's something that we can pick up with them whenever they choose. Um, we're not going to sit down with them every time they're in and want to talk about, you know, end of life planning. But if we've got somewhere where we, they know that we've recorded what their wishes and wants are, whether it is the child or young person themselves, or it is the family, um, it's a good starting place for us when that time does come that the child is using our rainbow suite. Um, and again, if there's certain wishes of the child or young person themselves, it's really important for us at that end of life stage to be able to kind of pass these needs and wishes and wants on to the family. Um, if they've not communicated between themselves before that and we're really just always trying to promote communication between everybody within the family unit, whatever that may be, and support throughout the whole staff team.